So eight years ago, I embarked on two different journeys, two different projects. The first was to take this idea I had about this album I loved since I was a teenager and to try and make it a Broadway show. Now, I didn't work in Broadway. I had never worked on Broadway. I did not live in New York. I did not work in the music industry. And I did not know anyone who did any of those things. So I knew it was going to be a bit of an adventure. Uh, but with a lot of help from friends and partners, some of whom you've met today, in uh, six weeks we opened at the Broadhurst Theatre. So that was journey one. The, the, the second journey, uh, and the decision was taken at exactly the same time, but they weren't connected, was I decided that I was going to immigrate to America, that I was going to become an American citizen. And that was also going to be an adventure. And what I want to talk to you about today is how those two journeys kind of ended up intermingling and how they started to inform each other. Because they, the only perspective I have to offer on Broadway is that of an immigrant, because I just got here. Um, now, I should say that I am not a casual immigrant. I am, I am a serial immigrant. Uh, I was born in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, which is the little country in Southeast Asia on that map. And the first time I immigrated was I was 20 years old. And I decided that I wanted to go and work and spend the rest of my life in London. And the reason I decided that was because I wanted to join the gods of the London stage and screen. I wanted to spend my life in theater and telling stories uh, on t in TV and cinema. And you can't really do that as a little brown boy in a third world country if you want to be a god of the London stage. There's kind of a geography problem you sort of have to move. <laughs> but in order to move, I needed a visa. Or I needed someone to help sponsor my pathway to citizenship. And well, it turns out that there isn't a visa category for ambitious 20-year-old who wants to be a star of the stage but actually has no discernible skills and hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> That's not a form that exists. <laughs> who knew? So I had to hack the system. I had to figure out my way to overcome that little hurdle. And my hack, and it may not have been the most obvious one, was to go to law school. <laughs> because it turns out if you go to law school, they do give you a visa. And once you're in law school, a law firm will sponsor your, your citizenship application. So that's what I did. That worked. I went to law school. A law firm paid for it. And then they hired me, and I became a citizen. Little problem, of course. I had to become a lawyer, <laughs> which meant, for at least for a while, I had to give up the dream. That was the whole reason for doing this in the first place. At least in England, lawyers get to wear fancy dress. <laughs> so it wasn't, you know. And also on this particular day when the uh, British Supreme Court just held our stupid executive accountable, I'm pretty proud I belong to this, to, to this fraternity <laughs> too. But this, and also this is not an unusual story. Immigrants will all know, you don't get to leap into a new country and also get your dream job. If you've ever taken a yellow cab in New York, you know that. They are driven by engineers and brain scientists who happen to have to become taxi drivers because they moved here from somewhere else. And so I accepted that as a truth. And the reason I know that is not only am I an immigrant, but immigration is the defining story of my family. My mother is an immigrant. Uh, she's the very little girl uh, on the left of that photo. And my mother's what's called a midnight's child. She was born in India in July of 1947, four weeks before independence, partition, and bloody sectarian uh, massacres and bloodshed. So she had to flee her homeland of Sindh as a baby uh, with her parents to Malaysia. 70-something years later, that journey's worked out OK. My mother retired recently as dean of her faculty at the university, five degrees, five languages, and a lot of grandchildren. So that worked out all right. I am, I am crazy proud of my mother. Um, at about the same time that my infant mother was fleeing um, India, this handsome young man at the age of 20 was preparing to stow away on this boat, the Apapa, from the British colony of the Gambia in Africa, for he, too, was seeking a better life. And he wanted to leave the Gambia to go to, to England to provide for his family back home and to build a new family for himself. He couldn't afford a third-class ticket or any ticket, so he stowed away and hid in the cargo hold till they were far enough that no one was going to send him back. 
I never knew him. His name was Ibrahim Nanjai. I never knew him, but I knew he succeeded in his mission to build a new family and to provide for them because about 60 years after this, I married his granddaughter, Janine, and she's sitting here today. And because, and because Ibrahim's granddaughter inherited his stowaway wanderlust spirit, when on about our third date, I informed her that I wanted to immigrate to America, she hesitated about a beat and said, okay, I'm up for that. Um, and so eight years ago, we did. Eight years ago, we started that immigration process. And eight years ago, it's still a work in progress. We're not here yet. I mean, we're physically here, but we're not citizens yet. We're still jumping through le legal hoops. And that frustrates us because, amongst other things, it means we haven't got to vote yet. And this is a time when we like to do that. Because, of course, eight years ago, we immigrated to a rather different America. We immigrated to this guy's America. And, and as a young couple of color immigrating to America with our roots in Asia and Africa, it was potent and symbolic to immigrate to the, to the country of a president with roots in Asia and Africa. It was pretty special, but you know, stuff happened. <laughs> and so when we finally got to start our family, our family and when Odetta joined us, the headlines that she had to contend with were sadly not as hopeful as the ones we had hoped. And so as, our, as the headlines are this daily theater of cruelty against people who look like us and immigrants, I find myself thinking a lot about the systems that keep people in and keep people out. And I find myself, we are very conscious that our journey has been relatively cushioned and privileged, paid for by the sacrifices of our parents and grandparents. We are insulated from these worse excesses, frankly, by money. And, but I find myself thinking about those who are less fortunate, and I start applying this framework to everything I do. I start thinking about these, these boundaries and these hurdles. And I've come up with what I call the three immigrant commandments that I think all immigrants who wish to uh, thrive, let alone survive in a new land, need to think about. And I offer them to you now. Here they are, tribe, money, power. When you turn up in a new land, look for your tribe. Look for the people who look like you with whom you have a commonality of experience because they'll take care of you. Follow the money. That one sort of speaks for itself. You're going to need some. Figure out who it has it and where it goes to. Thirdly, power. Figure out who makes the rules and who enforces them. Particularly, figure out who decides who gets to stay and who gets to kept out. And so as I began my journey to Broadway in parallel with this journey of immigration, muscle memory kicked in and this serial immigrant started applying this framework to Broadway and to how I might enter this world uh, in which we all now sit. And so let's start with Tribe. Tribe was kind of great, because coming from the outside, you look at a Broadway stage, and I saw people that looked like my family. And I saw people who were singing and talking and telling stories of immigration, of color, of race, of complexity and diversity. And let me tell you, that is rare. As a person of color, as an immigrant, we don't get to see ourselves fully represented in the mainstream pop culture all that much. And over the last decade, Broadway has been a shining light here. It's still not perfect, but it's better than the movies, and you know, television is catching up, but this was so reassuring. And so as I started to work backstage, as it were, as I started to have to make the relationships and partnerships to bring Jagged Little Pill here, to take that idea and make it a reality, I was really hopeful that I would find the same complexity and diversity uh, offstage. Um, <laughs> Here's the metaphor I have. See if you can see it coming. I have found that offstage, it's kind of like below, it's all gorgeous biodiversity and an explosion of color. It's kind of like this room. But at some point, you get to the snow line. Now, even as I say that, I want to say that to some extent I did find my tribe because tribe is not just about color. And the senior echelons of Broadway, I will say this for them, they are welcoming, they are liberal, they are progressive, and they have been generous to me and to my show, and I'm honored to work amongst them. But at the same time, they all admit to a person they say that it is odd and embarrassing and just plain bad that there is no diversity in those rooms. Particularly bad in the context where shows like this are being put on, these extraordinary stories of slavery, of race, of black icons. It's very odd that in that environment, the people making the decisions do not have the diversity or the cultural context of these stories. That seems strange. And so the question that I kept asking myself was why? Let's follow 
the money. Here's the odd thing about money on Broadway. And there are many odd things, there are many complexities. Let me give you the big one that I found myself thinking about. Broadway is probably the only multi-billion dollar legal industry on the face of the planet where the bulk of the financing comes not from banks, from institutions, from private equity, from the public markets, from international conglomerates. It comes from people. It comes from individuals, angels or co-producers, who write individual checks. Now that's fantastic. Don't get me wrong, I am a producer. I like angel investors, I like co-producers, I love that the wealthy of Manhattan choose to reinvest some of their hard-earned money into the arts and into Broadway, that's great. But the practical problem when that is the majority source of financing is that to raise the money, you have to know these people individually. You have to have gone to school with them, you have to have hung out with them, you have to have known them, which generally means you kind of have to be rich yourself. And that's complicated. That is a barrier to entry from people from less privileged backgrounds, and it's one that bears thinking about. And if you need proof of that, think about immigration systems that value people who can bring money more than they value people who can just bring talent and, and, and heart and spirit. Because we don't like those systems, do we? So given that everyone agrees that, that they want Broadway to be more diverse, and how can we change it? And here we have to look at the power. And the good news here is that the power in Broadway is concentrated. It's that small group, it's the community, the word we've heard so much today. Hollywood is an industry, Broadway is a community. So if that small community just decided that they wanted to change the way that people got hired, that people got promoted, that money got, that, that money got connected between those with ideas and those with finances, they could do it. It's not like passing a comprehensive immigration bill through two fractious houses. It's a small group of people deciding and I think they want to decide it, and I think it's happening. And now that I'm here, hopefully to stay, I want to help it happen. And I think when it happens, we will start seeing different people telling different stories and finding new audiences. And that's an economic reason, but there's another very simple reason that we should do this. It's the right thing. And we should do it because they are people coming, they are young, diverse people coming with talent and ambition, and they're not all waiting for an invitation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.